must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody, and thanks for listening to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Brandon Pollan, and of course, I'm joined by my fellow co-host, Stephanie Wyrock, but she'll be joining us actually a little bit later in this interview, and unfortunately, F. Scott Buell is unable to join us this evening due to some prior commitments that he he already had. But today, we have the esteemed privilege to talk with three people who have been involved with a unique method of improving... SPT Academic and Clinical Readiness at Quinnipiac University Physical Therapy Department, as today we welcome Jason Meyerson, who is a clinical adjunct faculty at Quinnipiac, Ellen Weatherby, who is the ACCE at Quinnipiac University, and Mario Paredes, who is a student of this academic and clinical readiness program about to enter the workforce. And I wanted to bring everyone on today to really talk about this unique program that the physical therapy department puts on to prepare students for not only academically, but clinically for the real life hustle and bustle of the clinic. And, you know, first and foremost, I got to thank you all for coming on today to talk with our listeners to really share this insight. Do do you think that you could each kind of give our listeners just some brief background into who you are and how you each got involved with the university? And, and Jason, we'll start with you and then follow up with Ellen, then Mario after that, if that's cool. All right. Thanks, Brandon, for having us. And uh, thanks for the HET team for having us as well. I'm a physical therapist with Select Physical Therapy in uh, Shelton, Connecticut. I graduated Quinnipiac with a master's in physical therapy, and then I furthered on into my doctoral degree through Arcadia University. I've completed a manual therapy residency and fellowship through the Old Grimsby Institute, and I'm also a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapists, board certified in orthopedics, and I've done some dry needling certifications as well. And the idea is behind all this continuing education and growth, uh, I wanted to take everything I've learned and share with the students. So for about the the past five years, I've been involved at Quinnipiac University in the musculoskeletal curriculum and some other facets as well, too. And I also teach for a company called IAMPT, the Institute of Advanced Musculoskeletal Treatments, and also with Select Physical Therapy for their weekend courses, continuing education courses as well, manual therapy certification and dry needling. So that's me in a nutshell. And um, I'm Ellen. I've been an academic coordinator and director of clinical education since 96. I started my career in academics at the University of Hartford and then came to Quinnipiac University in 2013. Prior to that, I worked as an outpatient orthopedic PT, and I was an OCS from 96 to 2016. I've also worked as a per diem therapist in home care and as a case reviewer for workers' compensation cases. And hello, my name is Mario Paredes, and uh, like you said prior, I just graduated from Quinnipiac University in, in the cohort of 2018. Um, while I was in PT school, I also took a lot of continuing education courses, anywhere from Mulligan to uh, FMS, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm excited to start my PT career. Well, very good. I really like how this panel is really going to have kind of different perspectives between adjunct faculty, um, ACCE, and also a student, because I think getting every perspective on this program is really important. But, you know, kind of before we get into this topic formally, let's kind of set the stage as I kind of want to ask this question um, to Ellen and Jason first, as we have heard from many students how they felt very unprepared for the clinical world once they entered the workforce as an independent clinician after graduation. Now, of course, realizing that this is student and program dependent, along with a lot of other factors contributing this too, 
But what are your thoughts on why this phenomenon of students not feeling or being prepared for the real life clinical environment is happening on the scale that it's currently happening with across the US? Well, this is a really great question. And uh, I'm lucky to be able to see this from almost two sides of the spectrum. I get to see the university setting, as I mentioned, I'm one of the instructors in the curriculum, but I also get to see this in clinic because I take two to three students a year from various universities, and I also get to oversee the Select Physical Therapy Mentorship Program where we hire our new grads. Uh, what I've noticed on the academic side is at times students are not put in enough stressful situations, and I think we all could attest to that. And these stressful situations foster them thinking on their feet. So when they enter the clinic, especially the outpatient orthopedic setting, they end up struggling. Um, in addition, I think students have a difficult time answering the why of what we do. This is seen so many times when students are on clinic and attempt to explain to a patient what's going on, or they're put on the spot to answer different questions from their CI, from staff, and from the patients. Another reason, just if I could keep going, is students may not feel prepared could be attributed to the clinical instructors that they're assigned to. Not all clinical instructors are the same. Um, not all clinical instructors have the same training, have taken the same courses, and also not all of them have the same passion, skill, and the ability to work with students. Um, to challenge the advanced student is very difficult, and to take a student that's struggling and not doing what they should and not putting everything together is also a struggle too. So again, pairing them up has been a big challenge. Um, I can I can certainly uh, add to this. I think Jay has summarized a lot of concerns that I've seen. I think in general the the clinic uh, the patients are much more complex, and the high productivity demands of the clinic it develops a greater level of stress on students, and it's certainly difficult to mimic that in an academic setting. Uh, beyond that, I agree that we in the academic setting need to um, need to more adequately meet the challenge of preparing students to function in a manner that prepares them to quickly respond. To, you know, they've got to have an unexpected uh, situation that they're faced with in, in, um, in the clinic, and they have to be able to respond real time to various scenarios. Um, in academia, we struggle with having a balance between what we need to achieve just content-wise versus how to actually then integrate some real world situation and, it, and it's it's always a balancing act i think that um jay makes another good point as it relates to clinical instructors they do need to have um greater preparation to be clinical teachers i think we've all kind of taken it for granted that oh after a year experience they're good to go and that's not always true that they that clinical instructors feel as confident about their ability to clinically teach um, there have been some discussion in various circles within my especially academic world that perhaps there should be some sort of ongoing certification for a CI that's similar to um, having an OCS or a PCS and that would allow CIs to professionally develop for clinical teaching and become specialists even in that area. And the other part of this is that the profession needs to have greater clarity on what it means to be entry level. Um, I'm not sure that we have a really good working definition of that that's well understood and that's been standardized enough. Um, there's certainly the CPI definition of this, but I'm not sure that it's been consistently interpreted by all who use it. And then this creates stress of kind of uncertainty in students about what really is expected of them. Uh, Diane Jetty, she kind of addressed this with others in her article dating back to, I believe it's 2007, it's about what CI's perceptions are about what comprises entry-level practitioners. And the research indicated that CIs expect graduates to perform with mentored independence. So this would imply that um, although graduates will be able to get licensed, enter the workforce, and see patients independently, they still are going to need mentorship as they move further into practice. And we keep talking about, you know, whether students really should have long-term internships or should they go into residency? Would this offer kind of that mentored independence that is needed? Yeah, well, I think those on both sides, there's were so many good and powerful points in there. Before we keep going with that though, Mario, Mario do you have any thoughts or things to add on to that? No. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything that was said. And, um, Something that I like to think of like entry level would be that um, we're appropriate and effective. 
So if a student is appropriate and effective, then they meet those requirements to be entry level. Mm-hmm. But I also think that uh, one should strive to be better than that. Yeah. And a good CI can promote that. Absolutely. And I, I really like, Ellen, that kind of idea that you had mentioned about continuing clinical education competence, kind of like mm-hmm. really progressing that over a career, because that's not an idea I had heard of yet on the show. So I love hearing kind of new ideas like that, because it just kind of gets the thought processes going and such. So I mm-hmm. think that's great. Now, the, this, and I know you guys have talked a lot of topics that, you know, go advance well beyond clinical education. We go to residency, fellow. I mean, that's just a whole big box with everything. Mm-hmm. I'm not, and I don't know what the answer to all that is, but, you know, but I see what you guys have been trying to do. You guys have been really been successful at kind of implementing some change kind of at your local level or kind of at the university level. So I'm kind of curious to know what drove the Quinnipiac, the Quinnipiac University PT department to develop this academic and clinical readiness program. Like, like what was the wake up call, like tipping point and, and what did you have to do at the university level to really let these programs be implemented? So I I can't say that there was one instance. I think what we saw was a gradual occurrence over time. Like I said, there's greater complexity that's happening um, that students have to to respond to in the clinic and also the demands and productivity. So we just realized that we couldn't expect students to perform effectively in the clinic if we didn't, if we just limited their preclinical experiences to, you know, this traditional classroom lecture and then discussion. So we had to prepare them to be able to work in a real world situation where they apply and adapt the knowledge that we teach them to these authentic experiences. And then to be honest with you, the other part of this is that our accrediting bodies have understood this too. And so now it's very um, written into, it's very overtly written into our accreditation document that we have to demonstrate how it is that we prepare students for um, uh, clinical experiences. Gotcha. And does that have to be like, does it, does the accrediting body say a specific example of that or does it let you be pretty creative in how you do it? Well, you, you have, no, they're never going to, going to mandate to you how to do it. It's up to us to decide how to do it and then to demonstrate that um, we're, we're being effective in it. Very cool. And you know, maybe for someone who perhaps is hearing about this program or this idea for the first time, do you think that you could kind of walk us through the structure and details of kind of this academic and clinical readiness program that Quinnipiac University PT department has developed? Mm-hmm. I, can, I can start that. And I think Jay can also um, chime in. But um, there's, there's multiple facets in what we do. So uh, what's been happening over the course of m- many years, certainly even before I got there, was that they were building in these what we call integrated clinical experiences to the curriculum. So what this means is that if, if a faculty is a member is teaching a specific course, they arrange then for students to go out to clinical sites and interact with patients. But in making that arrangement, there's some really deliberative action that the faculty member makes in designing that. There are specific objectives that the student needs to achieve, and it's always based on the curriculum that's been taught so that the student has the opportunity to really um, apply that knowledge. So they're put into a real work environment, there's unexpected situations that occur, and they have to, you know, apply and adapt all of what they've learned um, based on the objectives. And, And here's the other thing about the objectives. The objectives are in multiple facets of um, the learning domains. So it's, can a student, are are there affective um, learning domains met? Meaning, uh, can they act in a professional way? Can they communicate appropriately? And then also, can they demonstrate the cognitive domain, which is, you know, demonstrating clinical reasoning and a rationale for what they do? As as Jay had mentioned before, the, the why. And finally, our profession is so heavily manual, you know, can they also perform in the psychomotor domains? So that's what those integrated clinical experiences are. It's not just taking a test on on a piece of paper. They have to apply all those things together. Um, We also provide opportunities for students to engage in um, what we call simulated experiences with standardized patients. So standardized patients are paid actors, so to speak. Um, they, They act as a patient We put students in rooms that look like treatment rooms, and um, the patient acts out a specific 
by diagnosis, and then the student goes through an evaluation and uh, plan of care process with, with those standardized patients. But then finally going out on full-time clinical experiences, we need some sort of baseline to make sure that students are ready, and we have them go through what's called a clinical readiness practical, or a CRP. And so faculty have um, developed and piloted a series of cases um, in which the students perform essential elements of patient um, evaluation and management. And there, there's always two faculty members. One, one acts as the patient, and the other is their monitoring. And those faculty then, um, at the end of, of the student's presentation, basically, they discuss with themselves how the student's performance went, and that we go to a standardized rubric to determine if students pass or fail. If I could build on that a little bit, so what Ellen said is great. She kind of talked about the clinical readiness practicals, the standardized patient, as well as the integrative clinical visits. But I don't think you really talked about how great these clinical readiness practicals are. Like the students really need to show competency in these, in, on these practicals before they go to clinic. It's kind of like our checkout for that. And it's not a simple case. They're not given like a, someone mocking out an ankle sprain. They're very complex. They usually have an orthopedic component a neur with a neural component or an orthopedic component with a cardiovascular component. And there's a lot of them like that too. And it's how you manage the patient and what happens if they are holding their breath and, and re ruling out red flags and treating that patient appropriate with multiple comorbidities. Um, one other aspect of the curriculum that I find really effective and is our case-based practicals in the lab courses. So I can only really speak about the musculoskeletal practicals that we have, but for all the other courses in our neuro and our peds, there's following the same suit as well too. And basically what happens is throughout the curriculum or the, the semester, the students get checked out on all their skills. Uh, the GAs do that or us as instructors, we do that. But their practicals aren't just show me this. They're handed a case, basically a short history, and the student performs a, a, a examination on a mock patient. They decide what tests and measures they want to perform, and they perform them. They evaluate the results from the person mocking them out, and then they have to implement an actual treatment plan. Uh, they're only given a certain amount of time to do this, and then after, they head into a sec second room, and in that room, they're out in front of a computer, typing up their assessment, their short-term, long-term goals, and basically doing this is it like it's an authentic learning experience like they would in clinic of treating a patient, writing your notes, et cetera. Very nice. And, and guys, how is that kind of, I know you kind of mentioned all these things that are kind of implemented. How from a, like from a program standpoint, from like a student, like through, they're going out throughout the program, like how is that kind of all structured? Like what's the order that a student would kind of normally go through? When the student comes into our program, um, within the first year, they're, ha they're experiencing, A, the clinical integrated experiences where they're going out according to courses and spending time in the clinic, as well as having um, just practicals within a course that are designed, as Jay mentioned, to be very authentically based. At the end of their first year, which is right before their initial clinical experience, their initial full-time clinical experiences. They go out for 10 weeks. We have them go through a CRP then. Um, they come back. They, again, go for another year and a half where they're having integrated clinical experiences and they're getting you know, tested in practicals in a very practical way, in a very authentically based way. And prior to their final two clinical experiences, each of those are 12 weeks, we again give them more complex clinical, reason, uh, clinical readiness practicals. So the first clinical readiness practicals are meet, meet those students where they are in terms of their performance level. And then the final ones, though, are much more complex. I'm interested, Mario, for you to talk about where you were at prior to going through this clinical readiness program. How did it transform you to the level that you are at today? So like Ellen stated, it all started with the uh, integrated clinic visits where a group of three or four students attend a clinic and they evaluate and treat a patient with the help of a temporary CI for that particular day. And it is very helpful because you can practice what you're learning in school with real patients in a safe, non-threatening environment. And here you get to bounce off ideas with the group and your CI also lets you do what you want to do and then gives you helpful tips throughout. But then there's the clinical readiness practical. 
And for this, I'll talk about my personal experience. So before walking into the room to see your patient, you get a sheet with all the pertinent information about the patient and the patient case. And here you do like a somewhat of a chart review. In 15 minutes, you write down everything you're going to examine it and evaluate, et cetera. For this case, I vividly remember thinking that, oh man, this is super easy. I was able to list all the precautions, everything that I was going to look at from range of motion to the questions that I was going to ask the patient and even his family. But then I walked into the room and I had this paralyzing fear. I couldn't think on my feet. And for some reason, I couldn't say what I wanted to say. I was too anxious. And I just was shaking and everything. And um, best way I can describe it is with this analogy. I knew all the recipes and everything I needed to know, but I couldn't cook the dish. (laughs) Uh, I was too in my head. And because of it, I didn't pass. At the end of it, though, um, I was happy because I had the realization that I needed to improve on something. I was I needed to work on thinking on my feet. The second time I took the practical, I passed, and I continued to work on it even in clinical as well. It was complemented well with Jay giving me some drills on thinking on my feet and thinking out loud, and Ellen always provided sound advice. I continued to put this into practice, and I improved throughout the 12 weeks and even onto my next clinical as well. And I, like anything happened, I was able to manage patients, and anything that they threw at me, both foreseen and unforeseen, I was able to control it. So long story short, it did help. Your story in terms of how, when you were going into it beforehand, you kind of read the chart and like, oh, this is easy. I know exactly what I'm going to do. Boom, boom. But then when you get into the real situation, it's like freeze. And then you kind of lock up. And and I understand that completely, man. I was there early on too. So I think that, and I think that's something that a lot of people, at least in my class experienced initially as well. But I really think kind of learning from that and Jay giving you some drills like you kind of mentioned to help advance that was definitely seemed to help you a lot. And like you said, and you know, so so kind of with you being pretty much about ready to enter the workforce and kind of what you've learned through this program, Mario, what advice would you give to current students about how to best prepare themselves to enter the clinical workforce? Um, So recently a couple of key students, but younger students have asked me the same question. And I uh, came up with these five things. One, Be a student. Don't get caught up in your beliefs and what you learned or what you know. Wake up every day and be open-minded. Be hungry. My goal in clinical was to learn everything that my CI knew. I wanted to walk like him, talk like him, and then I wanted to put my own spice and make it mine. But in the meantime, ask questions. Your goal shouldn't be how can I pass this clinical. Instead, it should be how can I learn as much as I can from this experience. Two, change your mindset. In other words, define your why. Why are you in this clinical? We could say, an acute care clinical is a requirement by my school, or I will never work in this setting ever again. Those things might be true, but they shouldn't be your why. Instead, think about what you can get out of the experience, how you can improve your communication with patients, how you can network, etc. Have a positive mindset, and that will lead you to positive outcomes. Three, be humble. As students, sometimes we become enamored with the idea of blaming the clinical site or saying, oh, man, my CI sucks. Well, that shouldn't take away from your experience. If you don't like how the clinical is or how your CI treats, it's okay. Now you know how to define yourself as a physical therapist by the process of elimination. Finding ourselves like what we are not is the first step into finding who we are. So make the experience count. Four, uh, self-awareness is a game. Practice as much as you can. If you don't know something, learn it and practice it. Feelings or emotions are unintentional. But if you practice, then your thinking and your actions are going to be positive and ingrained in your system. It will become second nature. And five, be personable. You're joining a profession where you're going to serve others, from the staff, CI, and all your patients. You should be kind and show empathy. The reason why I've had so many amazing opportunities in my short career has been because I have always showed a smile and looked at people in the eye. And lastly, my punchline is just go out there, have fun, and never stop learning. I think that that's really great advice, Mario. I'm interested in, in addition to kind of expanding on what you're saying, uh, do you guys at Quinnipiac University have any data on the outcomes from your students that have gone through this program? Um, so we've been building the program over just within the last three to four years, and we're, we're trying to build in more formalized outcomes um, measures. But 
what happens like with the integrated clinical experiences, there's a standardized rubric that comes back that's completed by the, the supervising therapist on site comes back, the uh, faculty member who's in charge of integrated clinical experiences then looks over those rubrics to see if there's um, common trends. If there are, then that should inform a curricular change. And, and um, we discuss that as, as an entire faculty. And really, that's pretty much the same process with the clinical readiness practicals. There's two faculty members that review all of those grading rubrics, and, they, and they're looking for trends. And if there's a set of common mistakes that are made, we're kind of like, oops, we need to uh, teach that better to our students. Um, we have also you know, interviewed our students and asked for feedback. They've consistently mentioned that they want to have authentically based integrated clinical experiences as many as possible. And they also know that these practical exams where we see these students wigging out before they are taking them and they're just a nervous puddle. They've said, yeah, we acknowledge we're really nervous. We know it's, it's really anxiety provoking, but we also know we need them. So right now we're, we're collecting, you know, information on trends and, and um, in, it goes back to faculty to inform our curriculum. So, you know, kind of going through this, I know we've kind of gotten talked about the data and about this program, but of course on this show, we kind of like to play devil's advocate a little bit here. So from your guys' perspective, both from kind of being on the inside doing it, but also uh, Mario, from your perspective, undergoing it, what do you guys feel are the limitations and things that this program, um, between all the variations that, of um, subgroups of it that you had mentioned, can improve on to continue to really be effective at preparing students for the real clinical world? Well, from my end, I wish we could do a lot more of this. Uh, I wish we could have more clinic. We could send the students out for more clinical visits. Um, I could take more students or the CIs could take more students for these type of visits, as well as the other aspect of it is more advanced training for our CIs. So we've talked about it a bunch of times, uh, creating some continuing education courses for CEHs, CEUs to help train our CIs in different cases of different avenues with different styles with different learning objectives and i'm hoping that's the way we could go into but unfortunately that's about it for now the other thing is that um limitations always you know <laughs> the university might not want to hear this but you know we have to always ensure appropriate enrollment numbers because if you have huge enrollment it limits your ability to do this effectively um, it, it does cost money. We, we often have to pay for standardized patients. We have to sometimes pay for these integrated experiences. So there's a budgeting issue. And then scheduling can be um, a real challenge. If you consider that students need to be in class, but also need to be at clinical sites, how do we schedule that? Um, I think that some universities, I think It'd be nice to have a little more latitude in terms of our uh, the way we structure our curriculum to get out of the traditional kind of semester class by class mode of um, teaching courses in a topical area. You know, perhaps we need to think about more theme based types of quote unquote courses um, so that they cross silos of information. But it's kind of hard when you're also in a traditional kind of um, scheduling mode um, by the university. You had mentioned uh, just a little bit ago that it'd be nice to have a standardized clinical education CEU course. I'm wondering what your thoughts are in how your uh, program integrates with the APTA Credential, uh, clinical instructor cl credentialing course. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a trainer for that. And, and so, you know, I try and teach in our consortium. We, I work very closely with our New England consortium of DCEs. So we provide, you know, regular access to um, that course as much as we can. But I think um, it's one of those things where um, I try as much as possible to encourage facilities to ask me, me and the other DCEs, ask us to, to, to do lunches so that we can do some training for clinical instructors about how to teach and that sort of thing. You know, but, but in all honesty, they're always dancing the dance of, okay, do we want, do we want in-services on, you know, actual clinical skills that you can apply in the clinic with patients or should it be about clinical teaching? So, 
you know, there's always this kind of yin, yin and yang and, and fight for time and that sort of thing. So we just keep working and trying to build relationships as much as possible with places so that we can be there to offer support. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I kind of have, I like the idea that Ellen, that you kind of said earlier in the show in terms of how to really think about making a kind of developmental program mm-hmm. throughout the continuum for clinical instructors. So kind of like an OCS kind of, but for clinical instructors. Kind mm-hmm. of. Throughout. And I guess my question to you, kind of now that we're on the topic of this clinical education component is, how, I mean, this is going to be very hypothetical and I get that. And I'm not trying to say any one answer is right or wrong, but just to start some ideas flowing here, how do you think like from a profession standpoint, that could actually happen and what are some of the potential barriers that we'd have to get through to make something like that happen? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a pretty complex question. So I think you have to decide, you know, what are the levels there and how can you do a developmental program for clinical instructors and then, okay, so how do you monitor it? So what does that mean that, you know, students are evaluating you, um, academic DCEs are evaluating you as the, as the CI is what I'm saying. And, and those are uh, some of the things that you would then uh, put forward as a portfolio to demonstrate your competence, perhaps doing some sort of the, the CI, the um, training, the CCIP, they call it, they have assessment centers. Maybe you increase the complexity of those assessment centers. I mean, I am just like blurting out things that are coming to the top of my head. It, it's not going to be an easy thing to build. But, um, and I just think that being a clinical instructor is a lot of hard work and it's really hard to become a specialist in everything. And if there are some really passionate people who want to specialize in clinical teaching, they should be rewarded for it. I agree, especially like incentivized too, because if it's not incentivized, that's really going to be hard mm-hmm. to teach people. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mario, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit because the question that kind of was asked about some of the limitations and things that can be approved on. Uh, Mario, from your perspective as a student, kind of looking back throughout the whole process, what are some things that you think perhaps maybe could have made that experience a little bit better? For me, scheduling was the main issue. Um, not all the students like lived in the area. Some, some traveled like myself included. So sometimes I had to like travel farther into like another clinic visit or, um, for school, like, uh, practical was right after a test, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, that's just scheduling issues. That would be my my best guess. Well, that's good that you're able to, um, you were able to share that feedback with the faculty members because I know that it sounds like they've been taking feedback into consideration a lot with this program. Is there any research, uh, not just in physical therapy, but just in healthcare education in general that supports interactive practicals and clinical readiness practicals? It's actually funny that you asked this because I kind of figured that with the podcast and everything else, this is going to lead into evidence and what supports it. So I was actually talking to one of my colleagues the other day, Jerry Monaco. He does the same thing that I do at Seton Hall. He's adjunct faculty. And um, we kind of went back and forth on a bunch of different articles. And I kind of wrote down a couple comments. Uh, could I go through them? Oh, yes, please do. Sure. So we really didn't find, or I didn't find too much in the actual physical therapy. And I really didn't find... And when I did find stuff in physical therapy, like the one thing I found was in New Zealand. And uh, this was a Roshan and colleagues article. And what they did was they looked at uh, fourth year physiotherapy students and how they prepare for their clinical. Uh, they were interviewed face to face. And basically through the interviews, they were mentioned that a lot of them that they were underprepared and they lacked direction and guidance as to what to expect. And basically the article states that the students continued studying and preparing for their clinical basically the way they would do in class, hence studying for an exam, studying for a test, and not study basically putting themselves in role-playing or stressful situations. So I actually thought that was interesting, but um, in the nursing and the medical literature, this is common in their practice. In nursing and medical, they have a lot of high stressful learning experiences, and there's unfortunately limited evidence of what's published so far in PT education, but we all know of what's published is not what goes on right now. There is a lapse in that. But the uh, Silberman article in, in 2016 looked at PT student clinical performance in the acute care setting. And basically they found that adding in that simulation training that we're talking about that we're doing in the, in, for our students has shown basically 
that the students are a lot more prepared and they have improved performance in their clinicals. So this may be used kind of to help motivate or inspire insight to do this for other settings in outpatient ortho, in acute, in pediatrics. And two other points that I kind of wrote down was um, other articles mentioned a lot about using role playing and standardized patients to ensure safety skills with students which I think is really important as well, too, making sure they have good body mechanics, uh, picking, having the students pick up on appropriate red flags, and also kind of reading the patient and kind of going back to how they respond. And this has also helped to improve the confidence of the student and get them ready for their clinicals. But the last comment I'd like to make, and this is, I thought was awesome, one article, 2018, uh, so I think it's called Preparing Physiotherapy Students for Clinical Placement. Um, the author is Dalwood. They talked about the students really enjoyed all these experiences, but their negative comment about them was that they lacked realism. Because most of the time it's actors, it's other students, or it's faculty mocking this out. It didn't have like that true effect of actually being in the clinic. So we have to state that it's not a perfect scenario. Yeah, that, that's interesting that you say that because um, I was recently on a task force for integrated clinical experiences and Nursing has certainly done a huge amount in terms of developing um, high fidelity simulation activities. So they have these mannequins and you go into a room and it looks like an, um, you know, a patient's room with lines and tubes and the whole thing. And so they're developing these simulation activities and then I'm assuming they're also assessing. But we, you know, we on our um, integrated clinical experience panel that was responding to the American Council of Academic PT, we kept saying, you know, what about using um, simulation activities as integrated clinical experiences? And as Jay just mentioned, the unpredictable nature of the workforce, you know, the workplace is not there and students comment on that. But I think we need to do more research to see if, if those outcomes that you can get out of students performing in that that venue is still a positive one. Um, so I don't think you can throw that idea out necessarily. Nursing has done a huge amount. They, and they even do um, algorithms and, and computer programs. I've seen that where you're just sitting there kind of going through an algorithm and um, they, they, you can get thrown in an unexpected situation even in, in a computer type of game. Um, and then just to also mention, medicine is doing these things called OSCEs, Objective Structured Clinical Examinations. Um, so, in, in it, you know, I think the challenge is, what do we want to assess and how can we do it in a reliable and va valid manner um, in terms of, of some, some of this uh, type of work? I think it's really interesting that you mentioned all those points as well as kind of the addition of, you know, it's not a perfect system, but... You have to do something to try to get mm -hmm. students to understand what it's like to be treating in the clinic and to make sure that they're safe from treating in the clinic. And apart from the academic or clinical readiness program that you guys have developed, what are some other solutions that you think could also help preparing students for real life clinical work um, that take place while they are still are in, while they still are in PT school? Um, I can take that question. Uh, if I had the opportunity to like do PT school again, like Jay said, add more clinic visits and um, with fewer patients, more practicals. And uh, but the thing that I would like to add would be getting an introduction to how to communicate with insurance companies, uh, maybe doing like some sort of like role playing, because um, we need that introduction of how to handle that conversation. Um, that would really benefit both the student and the new clinician as well. And uh, another thing that I would also like to add is uh, somewhat of like reflecting on your performance of how you communicate with patients. Students have to develop that communication and interpersonal skills. And in order to do that, you have to be able to show empathy from anywhere from paint science to being able to get that buy-in from patients. So if we could add those things to the program, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I think that communication piece, we probably do need to emphasize a bit more. Um, the other thing is that in the accreditations now for everything from medicine, nursing, OT, PT, we have to incorporate interprofessional learning and um, in, in the ability to work with um, 
each other. We, we've all got to respond to that in our accrediting documents. And it's a challenge because, you know, there's scheduling involved and how do you create those opportunities? So right now, Quinnipiac has a lot of service activities that are interprofessional in their orientation, um, such as a camp that students can do for um, uh, children with um, limb loss. There's a pro bono clinic uh, that's uh, staffed by OTs and PTs. There are some simulations that we do with medicine, PAs, that sort of thing. But they're all, they're optional in their co-curricular. So we've got to figure out a way to make them and carve out more time to get that in the schedule as well. Yeah, one thing I've noticed that a lot of students are doing to kind of, I guess, double dip, maybe make a little money on the side, but also kind of prepare themselves for clinical is, you know, get jobs as aides in clinics. That's been real helpful so they could see the hustle and bustle of the clinic. But also mm -hmm. like Mario was one of these students that just reached out to his faculty and said, hey, do you mind if I shadow you in the clinic for a few hours or a few days? You know, uh, for my position, since I'm adjunct faculty and I'm in the clinic 40 hours a week, it's great when you have a student say, hey, do you mind if I just tag along and observe and see what you do and interact with patients? Uh, it's great when some do that, but I wish there were more that did that. I wish there were more, C more PTs that would take on students as volunteers and shadows to kind of get them ready for that as well. I mean, I, I can respond to that, and I think it's affordability. Every single, you know, from medicine to PT, OT, we have to figure out a way to make this more affordable for, for um, a greater diversity of students to uh, attain, you know, their degree in PT, OT, whatever it is. Um, and I think that's going to take a lot of creativity in terms of the university trying to figure out how we can reduce costs at the university level to, to, um, to administrate our programs. And I think it's also working with the federal government in terms of can there be any um, forgiveness on loans if students uh, promise to work in underserved communities for two years or something like that. Mario alluded briefly to the insurance company aspect, but uh, I'm not going to give a cop-out answer, actually. Uh, I think the big thing is we need more business development and business management in curriculum in general. You know, uh, most students, yes, they want to start off maybe with a larger company or even a smaller company, but we got to teach them how to open up a place on their own, how to market on their own, how to advertise. You know, we talk about direct access and autonomy of practice and chiropractors do a great job in this. Physical therapists, we do a fair job and we could be better. So I think really educating our students on setting up a business plan. And if they do want to go out on their own, how to do it, that's uh, something that we're lacking. For me, um, I would say how to behaviorally train students on how to manage patients. So um, fueling that therapeutic alliance with the patient. And I would recommend like courses or practicals on building that relationship with the patient and creating that soft skill. I, I agree. I think that, you know, obviously, when we've asked other people this question, affordability is the number one answer that we get. A lot of the people in private practice also say that, we, you know, we need more business training. So those are, you know, all three of those are great answers. We do have a lot of people that do like to ask follow-up questions after they listen to a podcast. So where can people find you online or on social media if they have a question and wanted to reach out to you guys? I myself am kind of old, old school, so if people don't mind emailing me, I can be reached at e l l e n dot weatherby w e t h e r b e e no a in weatherby at quinnipiac dot edu. And for myself, Jay Meyerson, you can reach me at my email j b m y e r s o n at gmail dot com or my uh, professional Instagram handle the craft manual therapist. Uh, for me, uh, you can reach me at Mario Paredes, M-A-R-I-O dot P-A-R-E-D-E-S at Quinnipiac.edu. And we'll make sure to put those in the show notes for everybody uh, so that you can contact our guests if you do have any questions. Well, thank you so much for joining us, guys. We are so happy that we were able to have this conversation. And if any of our listeners do have any questions, please feel free to email our guests. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. 
Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low-cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.